Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Doug Piper, and I hope everyone is doing well, staying safe, and looking forward to the holidays. Now, I want to welcome you to Gourmet Brewing, where we strive to make your day more delicious one sip at a time. Now, I want you to know how happy I am that you're going to spend these next few minutes with us today. We've got a really great event lined up. I've really been working hard on this one for months, actually almost a year, as it goes back to about a year ago when we started thinking about how we could capture Celebration Ale. Now, Celebration Ale is pretty much a beer icon, and for a lot of us that have had it before, we look forward to it every year. Now, I want to bring on screen here our special guest. There we go, and it actually worked. So today, uh, we have Scott Jennings. Now, Scott, how are you? I know you've been crazy busy for the past few weeks. Thank you so much for taking time to, to do this when you've been so busy. Oh, it's great, Doug. Um, great to be back. Thanks for um, having me on the show. Uh, we're, uh, as you said, we've been working on this one a while, and it came up that um, you know, Celebration Ale is um, a whole lot more uh, complicated, perhaps. Uh, there's a lot more in it than, than people realize, and we wanted to tell that story. So, so here we are. Well, and it's going to be really a super deep dive into one of the most iconic IPAs in the world. So, but first, let me introduce you to who's, just who Scott Jennings is. Now, Scott is the brewmaster at Sierra Nevada Brewery in Mills River, North Carolina. Almost said South Carolina. I wish <laughs> we were in South Carolina. It's pretty close, but we're not quite there, Doug. No, we're not. So Mills River, North Carolina. He joined Sierra Nevada in 2001 after apprenticeships with Young & Co's Brewery PLC, the Ram Brewery in London. He holds a brewmaster's diploma from the prestigious Brewing Institute, VLB Berlin. He's the brewmaster at Sierra Nevada in Asheville, North Carolina. And when he's not brewing beer, he enjoys cycling and motorcycles. Now, Scott, before you and I met, I was really oblivious to the uniqueness of Celebration Ale. I honestly thought it was just a red variant of a Sierra Nevada IPA, but I've heard you describe it as labor intensive and something the brewers have a passion for. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, and then that's a pretty good way to put it. It's a very complex process. Um, what we do to make this beer is uh, not done anywhere in the world. Uh, it's it's a, a very complicated, long process. However, uh, it is... Uh, from uh, a brewer's point of view, uh, our favorite time of year. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't know a brewer, a brewer at the company who wouldn't agree that, uh, you know, there's no level of excitement that comes through the brewery each year than celebration season. Uh, it's something really special for us. And, and that just amazes me, Scott, because it's a ton of work. I mean, I've never seen so much hands-on disassembly reassembly it just blew my mind but yeah yeah we've anyway. got a lot of fun stuff to show you guys so stay tuned yeah <laughs> <laughs> so what i'd love to do is just quickly for those that are new because we have a lot of newcomers on this event today uh, this is gourmet brewing and we have free events that we do each month where we talk to subject matter experts on beer and other fine beverage this will be our 58th free event, and I have to give a big shout out and thank you to all the supporters because these events are crowdfunded by supporters, and because of, of them, they're free to you because we don't sell anything, and I'm not going to close with some unique opportunity at the end. These are all free training sessions or learning sessions that we do several times monthly. Now, we do get support from a very special group that supports the channel because they support it through our community at Patreon, and they're the reasons we're able to deliver this content for free to you. So 
If you're interested in supporting Gourmet Brewing's programming and becoming part of the solution, I encourage you to drop by our Patreon page. And that's at patreon.com, Doug Piper, or you can click on the green button there at the bottom. It'll take you to the page and you can explore and most supporters just buy us a, buy us a beer. Now, one of the things that really helps that won't cost you a thing is the follow button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. I think roughly about there. So if you click on that, that actually alerts you whenever the live streams go live. So there's no email, there's no spam. But what it does, it begins to count up as we get followers, just like YouTube. And when I'm talking to a, a guest about exploring joining the program, that's one of the things they look at and are impressed with. So if you can help follow, that runs that number up, and I'm more apt to attract bigger guests. Now, if the webinar is, isn't playing correctly, refreshing your browser window solves most issues. You can also reduce your screen resolution of the program by clicking on the little gear in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. We have an ask a question button, we have polls, and in the chat, we'd love to see there's a lot of good activity going on in the chat, but don't put questions there. But it would be great to see where you're from and, and where you're viewing the event. So now, Scott, gotten through all that stuff, I can't wait to get into this program. I don't know that I've ever put any near this amount of work in any previous event. So I am, could you, well, before we get started, give us a quick overview of how different Celebration Ale is from most of the other beers that you brew. Okay. Um, well, uh, I guess I'll start by not answering your question really, really directly and say from the brew, brew house point of view. Um, and by the way, uh, for everybody watching um, behind Doug, the virtual screen, that is our brew house in Mills River. Uh, from the brew house point of view, it's fairly standard stuff uh, with the one exception of, as a lot of you know, we use whole cone hops um, exclusively on um, uh, most beers uh, and certainly in celebration. And uh, so as a result of that, we have one vessel in the brew house, which is a little bit unique nowadays. It's called a hop strainer. And that is there to, um, let me see here. Which one is it, Doug? It's the, the second one on your, over your left shoulder and the background. <laughs> and uh, yeah, well, no, the other way, other way, move the other way. The other way. That's right. And so uh, so we have to remove the hops that we've added to the kettle, uh, but we also use it as um, what's uh, referred to as a hop back. And so um, most of the weight of the brew house hops are added directly to the hop back so they don't go in the kettle at all. Um, backing up one half a step, uh, obviously uh, the most important part of what Celebration Ale is, is that it's fresh hops. And we only start making it in uh, September because that is when the hop harvest in uh, North America happens. And so um, that is really what makes it so special is uh, it is made every year without exception with hops that are uh, harvested and uh, and uh, packed in bales and shipped to the brewery within days of when we start brewing the beer. And, and that is something really pretty cool and pretty unique. Um, I was telling Doug one of the stories uh, that, uh, you know, we, we just love is when the hop truck is on the road, the hops are coming from Yakima, um, Washington for the most part. And uh, when the hop truck is on the road, we get almost play-by-play -play alerts. You know, where's the hop truck? How soon is it going to be here? Uh, and we oftentimes start brewing uh, before it arrives so that by the time our first batch is in the kettle, the hops are, uh, have showed up and, and we're, we're ready to go. Um, and uh, it's, it's really pretty amazing that way. And when the truck shows up, there is generally an audience waiting uh, to open that truck just so we can appreciate the aroma of those hops 
that is just so intense and impactful and even uh, as brewers inspiring uh, when you get those fresh hops in uh, immediately after harvest. So that is probably uh, the most important element of the beer. Uh, beyond yeah, that, that, we, that might we have, have been a, my biggest disappointment in, oh, in yeah. COVID, of course, <laughs> read that. <laughs> right, right. But, but I was hoping to film that. that. That was the one thing we didn't get to do that we hoped to do. Yeah, I have a photo of on my phone here. Maybe I can share it somehow of uh, opening that truck up and just, um, you know, um, the uh, the back of um, um, shipping trucks have double doors that, that open like this. And uh, the as soon as you open those up, it's just a solid wall from floor to ceiling of hot bales. And uh, the aroma comes out of there like a tidal wave and it just washes right over you. Uh, it is something that uh, you just got to be there, Doug. You just, you just got to be there. Is it more intense than your hop room? Mm, well, that's a good question. That's a really good <laughs> question. Um, I don't know. I don't know. To me, okay. I guess I would say it is because I anticipate it so much. Yeah. It's a special moment, maybe more so than the, because because you you go to the hop room all the time. You right. only get to open that truck once a year. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of that, I'm getting thirsty. Uh, I would love to open up a celebration uh, along with everybody else. And Scott, I'm going to start out with the label. Is there anything unique on this label we ought to point out for everybody? Oh gosh, I don't um, can't think of anything off the top of my head. The the fresh hop IPA that refers to um, as we just discussed those hops coming immediately and directly to the brewery uh, post harvest each year. Um, this is why we cannot start brewing the beer at the beginning of August, for example. It's not possible because the hops haven't come off the field yet. Uh, that happens at the very end of August, some years, some years, um, the very beginning of September. It's a little bit variable, um, but um, that's what the Fresh Hop IPA indicates, that that uh, element. Um, so is there any story to the cabin? Oh, I wish I knew, but that's a, a question for Ken, I would say. Uh, I will say that uh, periodically the cabin changes, sometimes uh yeah, it appears there's, um, you know, more or less light inside. I, I want to say there was a Christmas tree in there one time, uh, but uh, uh, I well, wish this I one's knew. got a wreath. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that that changes a little bit from year to year. Uh, but you know what? And we'll get into this too later. But the the beer itself changes a little bit year to year. Uh, so um, so so what's the package date on yours? Oh, let's see here. Mine is um, November the 10th. Ooh, okay. Mine's, mine's almost a month older than that. So we have to see if anybody in the, uh, in the chat there has anything newer than, what'd you say, November 10? Uh, yep. Okay. Well, Scott, I'm going to pour this guy. And if you don't mind talking uh, about this beautiful beer while I try and pour it. And I'm going to try and get a head like you got on the picture I saw. You had, what, about a th – gosh, it must have been five-finger head. <laughs> I'm going to try is, for it. Well, we have this unofficial um, uh, foam competition every year with Celebration among the brewers where we'll share photos via text with each other about uh, – uh, pouring uh, celebration because it has really a remarkable, um, amazing, incredible foam. Um, it's it's <laughs> it's really astounding sometimes. Uh, but I'm gonna try yeah. and top yours. Well, all right. Um, yeah. So let's let's get to pouring uh, right away. You'll notice. Um, the color, um, it really is a, sort of a, a garnet uh, reddish color. Um, maybe uh, some call it like a, like a chestnut, uh, mahogany even. 
that's from a um, uh, very liberal use of crystal 60. Uh, that's 60 Lovubon crystal malt um, in the brand. Uh, aside from that, it is just pale ale malt. Uh, so pretty simple grist. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, look at that foam. That is just astounding, isn't it? I love that. So the aromas you're getting off of it. Let's see how I'm doing here on mine, Doug. Oh, <laughs> you it's beat great me. foam. It's got great foam, doesn't it? I think you beat me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I believe I could come close to floating a dime on it, though. It is rocky. Yeah, it is indeed. It is very lush. Um, so I, am going to have a hard time getting an aroma on this particular glass, but I have another one here that's only half full, so I can really get into it a little bit here. Yeah. Uh, the first thing that hits me is the hop aroma. Um, but it is blended with a real, um, uh, bready, uh, caramel, um, malt intensity as well. Um, it is not a dry beer. It's a very full uh, finishing beer. Uh, but the hops are, there's a lot of pine in there. Um, that is from the Cascade hop and the, um, the pair, uh, to Cascade and the dry hopping process on this beer is Centennial. Uh, that hop is, uh, really interesting. It can express itself in different ways. Um, we, uh, tend to actually, when we go to hop selection, um, and, and brewers go to hop selection to choose the lots uh, that they uh, would like to use that, that year. And um, one of the characters that we always look for in Centennial um, is a, um, um, a rose uh, type character. So, so a hint of a floral note. In the hop itself, it's kind of hard to pick out. To me, it, it comes out um, as... A little bit um, oniony. I know that sounds a little strange. Um, but we do uh, look pretty carefully at the analytical values of the hops, um, but we find that um, uh, hops that we select that really do have a hint of a floral fragrance, um, some pine in there, and, and a little bit of onion um, in the beer translates into a lot of that rose character. So it's very floral. It's a nice uh, blend of a of a um, piney uh, and floral. Maybe a hint of uh, citrus as well, um, but um, I think those are the dominant hop characteristics. And as I mentioned, um, the beer is a little different every year. We get a lot of comments from people saying, um, "Oh, you know, my favorite year was back in you know um, '98 or." Uh, you know, <laughs> last year or uh, anywhere in between. Uh, and uh, it's funny. Um, we, we haven't changed the recipe for the record. I'll just say that. Uh, but uh, it, it does present differently every year. Um, and I always find it, uh, um, you know, just as um, uh, intriguing to uh, see what kind of feedback we get. Uh, you know, what people will say. It's, uh, it's, it's, like I said, it's a little different every year because the quality of the hops are different every year. Well, and it's evolving over time also, right? I mean, it's mine, mine's almost three weeks older than yours. So you're probably getting some aromatics that I'm not getting. Yeah, no doubt about that. No doubt. Um, we'll talk about uh, also a little later that we, we do bottle condition this beer. And that'll play a very big, diff, um, make a big impact in the beer when it's quite fresh. And then as the beer matures, uh, a lot of people say that the, the ideal um, age uh, for, um, you know, the beer to be really at its very best is probably right around a month. Um, so the, the esters that are generated during the bottle conditioning process are starting to, um, uh, really, uh, um, you know, harmonize with the hop character that's in there. Um, younger than that, you do get a lot more estery impression, 
Um, and uh, older than that, the uh, the esters don't play into it as much, and you get more malt character coming through. Um, but you're right. Um, it's uh, a beer that people will cellar, so you can uh, age it. We have barrel aged it in the past uh, as well, and it, and it handles that quite well. Um, yeah, Joseph says he's tasted a 2010 version a few weeks ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know a lot of people when they, um, you know, we talk about doing verticals, meaning tasting mm -hmm. beers of uh, various vintages. Um, Bigfoot is one that people love to do. Maybe we could do a show about Bigfoot one time, Doug. So, <laughs> so actually you can buy verticals right now from Sierra Nevada, right? That's right. On, uh, Bigfoot. I think I saw them. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, folks do it with celebration as well. Um, really, uh, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say, you know, um, you know, for what it's worth and, you know, I know that, uh, uh, I'm, uh, you know, maybe odd in this regard. However, um, uh, I really like celebration as fresh as I can get it. Uh, the same as, uh, with Bigfoot for me, I don't really like to hold on to it. I really prefer to enjoy it, um, as fresh as possible because, uh, for me, the most important character in the beer is that very uh, lovely and intense hop uh, aromatic. And as the beer ages, that, of course, diminishes. So that's why I like to have it fresh. Yeah, you were with me when I asked Ken Grossman. I said, I understand you like your Bigfoots a year or two old. And he said, you heard wrong. <laughs> he, he said, I like them fresh. <laughs> I remember that. I remember yeah, it, that. Yeah. I was uh, taken aback. He was uh, he was rather firm about it. <laughs> well, that, that beer is all about um, Chinook, uh, which yep. is very piney, uh, very resinous and a little grapefruit. Um, this beer, on the other hand, is more floral. And, and the pine is sort of backseat to the floral character, which is uh, pretty unique, I think. Well, Scott, you mentioned esters, and I just mentioned Ken Grossman. And so I've got a short clip that I'd like to play. Um, I, I was fortunate enough to help out with the Denver, Denver Rare Beer event, and I got to ask Ken a question about the open fermentation. And so there's about a one-minute clip uh, if everybody will indulge me here, and hopefully everything will work smoothly. Uh, and speaking of that, um, I, I'm trying more videos than I have ever done. So if this uh, doesn't work out, no, I, I have pushed my limits. So here we go. Uh, this is Ken Grossman uh, at the Denver Rare Beer event where I ask him about the value that open fermentation brings to Celebration Ale. Yeah, we're not brewing all of the celebration with open fermentation. We're doing what we can. Um, in the initial uh, early years, so when we first started making that beer in 1981, uh, all we had was open fermentation. So we, we had uh, no, no conical tanks or no um, uh, taller tanks back in that day. And so all the celebration came out of it. But we still nice. use it today. Uh, Mills River has two 200 barrel open fermenters and Chico has four 100 barrel open fermenters. And okay. we reserve those for the both beers like that, as well as even the, the more challenging ones to brew, like Bigfoot, which is you know real mm -hmm. high gravity and having a low hydrostatic head and the ability to um, you know, skim some yeast and do do some things. Um, so they, uh, I think, they have a benefit uh, as far as those kinds of. Uh, harder to ferment products just because of the lack of any pressure and a shallow uh, fermenter. Um, they've got their challenges, you know, they're manually cleaned and, and uh, actually Mills River, we do have a, a, a CIP system built into those tanks. Um, but uh, yeah, they give a different ester profile when you use those, uh, uh, those lower sure. shallow tanks. All right. I hope that played okay for everyone. And yeah, it looked good, Doug. Good, good. <laughs> this is this is pushing the technology that I have anyway. 
So what do you think of that, Scott? And how's that going to lead into the uh, fermentation sequence? We're going to show our time lapse. We're going to show that. Oh, yeah. I'm really excited about that. This is going to be really cool, everybody. Just wait and see what we're going to show you. Um, the the open fermentation bit, um, yeah, that's that's be been really interesting. I'll, I'll try and do a really brief um, explanation, um, um, backstory maybe about it. Um, as Ken mentioned, um, it was exclusively open fermented at one time, and now it is only partially open fermented. And, and a lot of that is due to just that, you know, the, the volume that we make of that has grown since 1981, uh, fortunately. Uh, and we just cannot put it all through the open fermenters. Uh, but we do find it to be really critical to the 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 character um, in, in the finished beer here uh, that it contain a portion of open fermented beer. Um, we have tried uh, many times in in sensory, but also really doing a lot of deep dive analyses, uh, comparing the beer from the closed uh, conical uni tanks, uh, which we dry hop. Uh, with the same hops and this, uh, roughly the same proportions uh, using the torpedoes uh, that we have. Most of you will probably know what I'm talking about there. Um, and the beer that we run through the open fermenters, we dry up in a totally different way, which you'll see in a little bit. Um, but uh, the beer analytically and um, from a sensory point of view from those two systems are different. And so to come up with uh, the finished product in the glass, um, it is very important that we do a very specific blend of those two different processes. Um, so a lot of it is, um, you know, necessitated by our production um, capability, uh, and uh, but also with a, you know, a little bit of um, design in there, just trying to shoot for a very specific flavor profile in the end. And, uh, and this is the only way to do it. So every single bottle uh, out there is a blend of uh, two diff very different and, and both equally challenging dry hopping technologies. Uh, one quite ancient uh, that we try and do in a modern brewery and that's really hard <laughs> and another uh i guess becoming ancient the it's a whole cone torpedo uh which is more than 10 years old now uh but in every case it's whole cone hops uh which is uh also something special well are we ready to show that video i think we are okay and i would ask the audience put in the chat uh scott is going to talk to what's going on it is not narrated on purpose uh you'll hear a little music and i i cannot hear if the music is overpowering scott so just write in the chat if the uh, music is too loud uh so with that scott we will try for video number three all right so what we're going to see is a view of the open fermenter and this is it just full of wart so um, the image is, makes it look a little, you know, oval or something, but it, but it's perfectly round. And here you see um, a little uh, action going on there that appears to be uh, by the edge, but it's really right in the center. Um, the we'll call that the nucleation point. This is wort that's been aerated and pitched with yeast, and now we're in the uh, respiration cycle or, or maybe the lag phase. Now, uh, as the oxygen is consumed, the yeast really uh, moves into fermentation, uh, the anaerobic state of metabolism of yeast, and it starts to produce CO2. So the foam is starting to build. That nucleus uh, is sort of moving around a little bit, and you'll see it do that. That's just due to the uh, sort of uh, convection dynamics within the tank uh, that's coming right up from the center uh, when CO2 is evolved by the yeast. It's uh, pushing up um, um, throughout the tank, but um, it tends to create a convection which uh, materializes really in the center. So it's wandering around a little bit. Foam is being generated. This is uh, 
due to CO2 production. Uh, the foam is, is really just a, uh, a protein matrix uh, with CO2 in it, and in this case, a whole lot of yeast. So yeast is, is really rising to the surface now. It's coming up with the CO2, and it's forming what we call the Krausen, or the Kreuzen, uh, depending on how you want to say that. And that's just growing and growing. And so far we've seen maybe six or eight hours. Uh, you'll see the sun come up here in a minute. Uh, this has started overnight. And look at that, just grow. It's, 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 it's almost alive and, and it really is. It's full of yeast. There's so much yeast in there. Uh, high Kreuzen is uh, the point where uh, the yeast is, is generating the most vigorous uh, fermentation activity and for this beer I guess for most beers that probably occurs in uh, uh, oh I don't know probably a little over 20 hours so here the foam is coming up uh, the sun is coming up and just look at it go it's absolutely rocking uh, the camera is mounted on uh, oh, uh, something like a spillway or a chute and uh, the tanks are designed to self-skim. So all of that yeast, that, that croissant, is, is coming right down a chute and into a collection vessel. Uh, so it's not overflowing over the floor, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. But check that out. Um, it is absolutely a living thing in every way. Uh, the whole film here is gonna show uh, probably roughly 24 hours worth of time. Uh, but you can see uh, it doesn't take long for the yeast to really wake up, as we call it, uh, and, and just get going. The original gravity of the beer is dropping like a stone right now. It is really just dive bombing down, going down from uh, about a 16.2 Play-Doh, give or take. Uh, and it's dropping probably uh, four Play-Doh at, at least, I would say, in 24 hours here, uh, which is the course of the film. Uh, this yeast uh, can be collected and reused. Uh, here you can see it's already starting to slow down a little bit. <laughs> wow. I need a beer after that. <laughs> oh my God, isn't that amazing? That is just really something. What a cool thing. You know, for, for those of you um, uh, who are interested, uh, Doug put a ton of work into this. You had a GoPro uh, that, you know, because of the mounting thing that you had it on, you weren't able to use the waterproof cover. And it was hanging there just above where that yeast was. And it, it very nearly got creamed, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, that was really very great. fortunate. And, and actually, that was our first try. I mean, that we we I guess we could have had a second try, but that really turned out. Uh, I, I I I like watching the whole thing, so it's a, it's a lot of fun. Uh, well, that yeah. was really cool. I, I I don't know about everybody else, but it made me really appreciate. You know the differences between you know a conical fermenter and an open fermenter. And, and how would you summarize that difference? Again, I know Ken, Ken mentioned it. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, that Kreuzen uh, that you saw there happens just pretty much like that in a closed tank, too. You just don't see it. Um, but the biggest difference is probably um, the geometry of the tank. Um, open fermenters are, are typically designed to have um, an aspect ratio of one to one. So... Um, then they do have a, a conical bottom on them, um, so it's uh, maybe not exactly one to one, but uh, roughly, um, you know, one unit wide to one unit deep um, is is what that means. So um, the result is that um, you have very little, uh, very very little hydrostatic pressure um, in the liquid, um, which uh, reduces ester production. Uh, the higher the pressure. Um, whether that's just a, a tall column, uh, which is a really tall tank, uh, and the hydrostatic pressure um, uh, generated there will, will reduce ester formation. 
Um, and then when you, of course, have to bung the tank or close the tank uh, for uh, carbonation generation, um, you have even more pressure. So um, uh, when the beers are, uh, e even, even today, this is, you know, a month old, uh, a little more, and you can still get esters, which are these uh, fruity, um, like um, some call them, uh, you know, bonbon or like a little fruit uh, candies, um, pear or apple or something like that. These are um, characters produced by the yeast. Uh, and that is heightened in an open fermentation situation compared to a uni tank. Um, one of the really important things in traditional Bavarian or, um, or Hefeweizen production, wheat beer, German wheat beer production, is open fermentation because of that uh, increased ester uh, production in the yeast that's so important in that beer. So, Scott, I've been in that room, and it's uh, closed except for a staircase. Mm -hmm. it, it looks like a lot of CO2 coming off of that. Is it actually... Yeah reach dangerous levels? Well, I mean, it could. Um, that's that's really a risk. Um, you've got to control for that with uh, proper ventilation. Um, in those rooms as well, we have, um, when, when you want to exhaust, um, you know, gas out of a, a closed room, you also have to have an intake, obviously. And that intake is um, um, uh nearly sterile, I would say. Uh, we try as much as we can to make it sterile, but we have uh, HEPA filters um, on that air intake, plus um, UV lamps in the plenum um, of those uh, air handling systems to try and make sure that we keep those rooms as uh, clean and sterile as possible. And then the one last sort of uh, technological thing that we would do to protect uh, microbiologically uh, the beer from contamination, because of course, with it open like that, a lot of people ask, well, can't, you know, flies or anything get in there? And um, we keep the room under uh, positive pressure. So for example, uh, when you open the door, if it's a push in door, you're going to have a really hard time pushing that door open because there's pressure in the room. Um, keeping it closed. And when you do get it open, air is rushing outward so that uh, the outside air does not come in. Um, so that's some of the things that we do to control for that. Well, uh, are there any hops in it at this point? Do you have any bittering hops that you've put in? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've hopped the heck out of it already by this point, Doug. Uh, the first edition traditionally is um, Chinook. Uh, and that's a, a high alpha hop. It's a um, U.S. variety, one of my favorite varieties, I have to say, because it's just so piney, uh, like a Christmas tree. And uh, I just I just love that uh, hop. You won't get a lot of that character from the first hop edition due to the boil um, is going to drive a lot of those aromatics away. But that's where the bittering edition is coming from, that first edition. Um, all of the bitterness doesn't come from that edition because proportionally we put the bulk of the hops in the hop back and even though they have a lower or lesser contact time with hot wort um, and by the way uh, for the listeners out there any of these um, um, terms or um, brewing process things that maybe uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not explaining uh, go ahead and put them in the questions um, I'd be happy to answer those um, well Scott talking about hops why yeah. don't we move into Ken's comments as to the hopping of Celebration Ale? Can we do that? Yeah, let's do it. All right. We're going to try again. Here's hoping. We first started, we um, chose not to use pellets. Um, we chose uh, to focus on, on using whole hops, and we were dry hopping uh, with some, um, I, I guess, uh, historical methods, which were pretty crude. And, and we still use some of those today where you, you know, just have a big mesh bag and you load them full of, uh, of cone hops. And, and yeah. um, we used to tie them on to a, uh, we, we, we welded hooks in the bottom of our fermenters to tie the bags on to, uh, to keep them from floating up. Right. Um, I remember Fritz told me they used to just put 
a bunch of chunks of uh, stainless steel old valve bodies and things in the oh, back. That's the yep. way to stainless make. stainless balls or marble, glass marbles, whatever. <laughs> hey, if it ain't broke. <laughs> yeah. um, and so that was what we we did, and and you know we had a open hop back, and um, and we dry hopped uh, with that method. Uh, you know, today we've got, uh, and, and actually I'll say when I had my home, that the torpedo was actually developed um, with Celebration Ale in mind because we were um, running out of dry hop capability with traditional bags. And we, and we still do uh, brew a, a good percentage of the Celebration Ale with uh, bags hanging in fermenters. So that that's always part of the celebration ale mix is um is fresh cone hops uh you know hundreds and hundreds of pounds of them um tied right. in with fermenters we only had uh cellar capacity uh both uh with our open uh cellar which are 100 barrel tanks and they go into 200 barrel um dish head non-conical uh storage tanks we got 11 of those and so those we can tie dry hop bags into and then we've got uh, another cellar, actually two cellars of uh, 400 barrel tanks that have removable cone bottoms. And so we have the ability to, to pack bags into those tanks as well. Um, and so uh, that was our uh, total capacity. Mills River, we've got um, uh, the two 200 barrel open fermenters. So that celebration goes into there. And then we have four 400 barrel um, uh, removable cone bottom tanks that we dry hop uh, conventionally in those as well. Uh, so it's a lot, lot of hop, hun hundreds of wet pounds of hops hanging in those uh, when we try to <laughs> well, and the, remove and them there, but challenging. The okay, and somebody was asking there in the chat as to whether this is archived. And yes, you can get it at the uh, original link that the live event that you're watching right now is at. So any comments on that, Scott? How would you, uh, based on Ken's comments? Well, um, uh, I mean, he, he pretty much said it all. Um, uh, you really got to see it to believe it. And we'll show you a little bit of that here later. Um, um, you know, the we, we've put as much hops into it as we physically can in the brew house. And then... Um, the beer stays in the open fermenter for um, right around three days. And then we move it uh, into a dry hop tank. And for that, we have to, oh, in Mills River anyway, you know, we've got, um, um, you know, um, cylindro conical tanks where you can remove a very small portion of the, the really end of the cone uh, to allow you ha access for bag, dry hopping as he described there. Um, but, um, you know, we've got valves hanging off of there. We've got a bunch of pipes that are connected to that and it's, you know, 12 feet off the ground. So we have to get on a scissor lift and we have to unbolt a bunch of stuff and disconnect a bunch of wires and a bunch of air lines and, and a whole lot of stuff has to happen uh, 12 feet up off the ground. And then we have to stuff the hops in there. So just a quick uh, description of how that goes, and we'll show a video, I think, here in a bit. Um, the uh, top of the tank, uh, which we don't, I think, show anything in the film, Doug, of there's a real small port that's uh, right around six inches in diameter that we can open. And uh, above that, we've got a, a, uh, a hoist, an electric uh, two-ton hoist. And um, so what we'll do is we'll, once we get the tank um, clean, sanitized, uh, we will open the top and the bottom. The bottom is a, a cone opening of maybe roughly two feet in diameter um, that is swung uh, to the side just to move it out of the way to expose the bottom of the tank. And then on the top side, we only have a you know six inch hole about yay big. And we lower the hoist down through there. And the hoist, uh, you know, it's a crane and it has a hook on it. And we lower it all the way down through the tank so that it comes out the tank bottom, you know, um, uh, way far below, <laughs> to use a technical term. And then uh, we uh, hook onto that crane 
uh, a stainless steel chain uh, that we have standing in a, um, a sanitary bath. And then we start hauling it up again. So um, we're, we've got a hook. It's connected now to a stainless chain. And now we're uh, all the way from the tank bottom hauling it up. And as we're hauling that stainless steel chain up, that chain is going to stay inside the tank. And it's going to run straight up through the center of the tank from the top all the way to the bottom. And every uh, few feet uh, along that chain, we're going to hook a bag, a dry hop bag. And uh, we put as much as we can physically attach onto that chain and, you know, uh, and get that bunch up and up and through that tank opening. Uh, it, it's really the absolute maximum uh, amount of whole cone hops that you could possibly stuff in there. And you'll see it. Uh, and these are bags. They're, they're a mesh bag. It's a nylon mesh bag. They're about the size of a pillowcase. Uh, and we stuff those full of hops, we tie them off, has a ring on it, uh, and then we hook it onto the chain as we're stuffing them in and hauling them up. Uh, and I think that's the next uh, part that we're going to see. After that, once we get it all buttoned up again, and, and you'll see that happening in the video too, what you won't see is what happens next. And that is simply that we'll transfer that batch from the open fermenter and we'll take the two 200 barrel open fermenters, usually around day three, sometimes day four, in terms of their uh, from time of pitch. And then we, we move it into the dry hop tank. Uh, so a couple of important control points there is, is uh, once we get the, the hop bags in the tank, we will purge the tank with CO2 to remove as much oxygen as we possibly can. You're never gonna get it all out uh, because just that mass of hops in there is really gonna uh, you know, entrap quite a lot of air. Uh, but we, we purge it to the very best of our ability. Um, we have specifications for that. And then uh, the point of moving the beer on that day three or day four at the latest is that it's still very actively fermenting. The yeast is, you know, going nuts in there, uh, and there's a heck of a lot of it. Uh, and so um, our hope uh, and what we found is that uh, by moving the beer at that time, any residual oxygen that is still entrapped within those dry hop bags will be readily consumed, quickly consumed by the yeast uh, to prevent any oxidation happening uh, to the beer. So timing is everything. This is happening 24 hours a day, you know, seven days a week. As you know, Doug, we found it uh, uh, going on uh, all the time. When we're making celebration at the brewery, it is absolutely humming. I, I thought I was going to have to camp out in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we wait for no one, Doug. The yeah, beer waits I for noticed no that. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we want to show that video, Scott? Yeah, let's see it. Let's see if I can go five out of six. We're, we're going pretty good so far. Uh, again, I've adjusted down the music just a little bit, so uh, let me know in the chat there if it's not quite right. It's most important to hear Scott, not, not the music. So here we go. Uh, here's a couple of shots of hop selection. So we are at a farm somewhere selecting the uh, hops that we are going to use in celebration that year. This is a shot of our hop freezer. You can see the bale stacked up there. Each of those is about 200 pounds, so they're pretty sizable. Here's our um, seller lead, Chris Lowe, assembling the hops. Uh, there's Curd and Scott Swan there. Here's Julia. This is the hop bag. Uh, getting ready to stuff them with the blend of um, Centennial and Cascade. Uh, we All of this is, is all by hand, of course. So here you can see the bags. You can see the ring on there and the knot. So in each bag, uh, we're able to put uh, right around oh, nine pounds or so in there, give or take. So here's that chain. Now don't forget that chain is coming from the tank top and it's hooked onto that crane. 
and it goes right down through that bottom. So um, as those are that chain, you can see it; it's being hauled up. And Scott Swan there, he is he is doing his level best to get all those in there as quick as possible. And you can see it's a heck of a job. It's a heck of a job. It's like a I don't know, like stuffing a Christmas tree up the chimney, <laughs> something like that. It happens real quick, but it is the absolute maximum amount of those bags we can get in there. So now we've got to put it all back together again, uh, which is quite a job. You can see some automated valves there uh, that have to be reconnected and a lot of piping has to be connected. These are our torpedoes. Uh, there's Kurt there, and they're stuffing uh, torpedoes. So those are just... Uh, tanks where we circulate the beer through a bed of hops as opposed to the dry hop bag method where we're soaking bags of hops in the beer in the tank so this is the the hopping method that we use on so many beers that we make um, this is something that we came up with well over 10 years ago um, it's our unique process and our unique tank designs as well so we're hooking these up to the tanks this is for the non-open fermented portion of the blend where uh, we'll hook these up to the tanks and run beer through a bed of hops. In the terms of celebration, it's the same variety, Cascade Centennial, and uh, we circulate that uh, for a couple of days. Nice view of the cellar. Um, you can see it's, it's, uh, oh, it's a heck of a lot of work to do that. Um, it really is, you know, leading into celebration season, we go uh, with the staff through some very rigorous training um, because it's one of the more complicated things that we do. Uh, those tanks are, are not meant to be taken apart like that. Um, that manual crane operation and the hot bag stuffing and and the timing of everything and, and the coordination between lots of different groups that has to happen all of that is so complicated that we train for probably three weeks uh, with the entire staff before we even make the first batch just to be sure we don't mess mess it up <laughs> well and, and I, I couldn't get over you weren't there a lot of the time so i got to ask them any question i wanted to and you know nobody was around, and they were all so excited. They were they were covered in stuff, and I was saying, you know, this looks like a lot of extra work. I mean, do you, do you really look forward to this? Oh, absolutely. This is just a special time at Sierra, and it was. I never found anybody. As a matter of fact, I, I can't remember his name, so I have to apologize. But the guy who who pulls the hop sacks out after they have been done. And I've got video of that, but I decided I wasn't going to show it. It's a little uh, graphic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a messy, was, messy job. Oh, he was covered in yeast and hop and, and just all that stuff. And and he was so excited. He's just kind of like, no, it's cold. It's miserable. These things are slick. But, you know, we only and do this heavy. once a year. Very but I did, I did find out something, Scott. I want to get some of the, that... The hop, I think he called it hop drippings. That's right. What is it at the end of the, that drips out of the hop sacks? Well, see, that's that's a, uh, a whole different topic here, Doug, but uh, I'll just uh, maybe mention it real quick. So um, so once uh, uh, the, the beer stays on these hop bags, um, and, and by the way, you know, um, if, if any uh, – uh, Sierra production people are watching, you know, cheers to you. Um, Celebration Ale is is the most amazing thing that we do. And uh, I'm super proud of it. I know you all are too. And you put in a heck of a lot of work uh, to make that happen. So cheers to you yeah. guys. Cheers. Absolutely. Mm. So good. That uh, the beer will stay on those dry hops, the bags, for... Oh, probably, I would say around 12 days. Um, so the primary fermentation has to wrap up. Then we chill the tank, and then it stays on the hops uh, while the beer is maturing. And then finally, uh, let's say around day, overall, day 14 or 15 uh, or so, um, we'll move the beer out and, and take it uh, through um, filtration. 
And um, so uh, at the end of that, you know, um, we've, we've, we, we're now emptying um, the, the beer out of that tank that you just saw getting stuffed full of hot bags. Uh, and now uh, the very important thing is we have to get those bags out of there again, uh, which is um, oh, probably, um, well, for sure it's a whole lot messier because now what went in as nice, dry, fluffy, you know, beautiful green hops comes out as uh, oh. very wet, uh, very cold. Uh, and because of now they're, they're, you know, permeated with beer, very heavy. And they also have a lot of yeast on them because, of course, you can't have beer without yeast. Uh, so it's, it's quite the thing. It is quite the thing to get those out. Um, but uh, before we do that, and every year this is a little different too. In some years we, we frankly just, just don't make it happen. Um, but um, we have a thing that we call celebration drippings, hop drippings. So uh, once we get the, the beer from the, from the tank transferred out, uh, the tank is empty now. Those hop bags are still on that chain and that chain is running from the top to the bottom and they're just hanging there. You know, you can imagine, uh, and uh, beer celebration ale specifically is dripping out of those hot bags, so uh, it's just sort of you know dripping out uh, because now those those hot bags are just hanging with the uh, full influence of gravity at work, and uh, and if you let it sit there for oh, you know, sometimes uh, it will will finish a filtration run um we don't really filter the beer by the way we just centrifuge it to get the yeast out but um uh sometimes we might wrap that up overnight and then we won't get around to emptying the uh getting the hops out of that tank till the next day so uh, those bags are dripping off overnight and so uh, we do collect what we call the drippings uh and this is beer celebration that comes directly out of these hop bags. Uh, and so it is the most uh, hop intensive thing from a whole cone point of view that uh, you could ever experience in, in my in my experience. Uh, and we do collect that. This year we have it available on draft uh, for takeout only, sadly due to COVID, at the tap room in Mills River, we still have some available. So if there are any locals watching, you can go there and get your crowler to go of pure celebration ale dry hot bag drippings. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Some years we'll, bar we'll barrel age some of it, which is really quite something uh, wow. as well. Wow. Well, I, I knew everybody was talking about it in awe, so I, I knew I was missing something when all the brewers are kind of going, oh, this is like gold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it really is. Well, we're really almost is. at the top of the hour. Uh, we have one more short video left, and we're not done yet with this process because there's some unique things that go on with packaging. So we've got one just slightly over one minute long video, and Scott, if you don't mind narrating that, uh, quickly because it flies by about in one minute but uh, we'd like you to hear what's important about the packaging uh, are you good with that scott yep all right we'll see for six for six on the video <laughs> all right so we're um important to mention that uh celebration ale uh, Doug, I don't know if you can hear the music's kind of loud for me. Anyway, but um, it's bottle conditioned, like we do with pale ale. Um, the pale ale is bottle conditioned. Celebration is bottle conditioned. Several others that we do are. Uh, the key points are: um, after we get the yeast out of the beer, we will warm it slightly to about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, and then we will add fresh yeast. And a little bit of priming sugar. Uh, this is uh, GMO-free uh, glucose. We are going to uh, create a situation where we can have a natural carbonation that occurs directly in the bottle. So that beer, when it comes off the filler, uh, will go into a 
storage warehouse, maturation warehouse, 62 degrees to mature, and it takes about two weeks to carbonate. So we'll send that beer to the packaging lines when the beer is not fully carbonated, but with some fresh yeast, uh, a little glucose in there, uh, so that we finally get uh, perfect carbonation in a totally natural way uh, in the beer. Um, it is a very traditional process. You don't see it very often, uh, but we think it is just the, the icing on the cake uh, for the beer. It really just uh, makes a, a good beer into a great beer. Well, Scott, that was awesome. It is the top of the hour, and I know some people only allow an hour for these. If you've got a question, and Scott, you're willing to stay on, maybe not whatever it takes, but you're willing to stay on for some more questions, right? Of course. Okay. So if you'll pop your question in, you don't even have to be here live uh, for Scott to answer your question. And a matter of fact, if you don't have a question, but you see one there in the list that you like, you can vote it up. So Scott will answer that one first. Uh, so Scott, as people are starting to pop in and populate any additional questions, for those that may have come in a little bit late, could you capsulize Celebration Ale and why it's not just another red IPA that Sierra Nevada produces? Oh gosh, that's hard to do in just a few words. Um, it's one of our uh, you know most iconic beers um, from, uh, first seen in 1981. Um, and to this day, it's still so unique that you don't find beers like this at all. Um, after, you know, 40 years, you don't find beers like this, uh, at all because the process is so unique. Um, it is so unusual. Uh, and, uh, wow. It just, it produces something, uh, that from a, from a brewer's mind, it is so special that we look forward to the production process as hard as it is for the whole year. And when it finally comes, we are, uh, oh, it's like a, it's like a, it's like a brewer's springtime, you know, come in autumn. Uh, it is, is the best time of year for brewing. Well, that was fantastic. So for those that have to go, and I know they do, and Scott, you've got all kind of accolades. I hope you'll look there in the chat, but. Joseph and Gary and Jack and Michael and Fred. Uh, oh, congratulations, Fred, on all the uh, recent medals that I saw that you got some gold, I think. Uh, and anyway, it was great. I'm so glad everybody joined us. So for those that can hang on, we're going to move into the questions next. And Scott, do you need to get a beer or are you in good shape? I'm ready to go. Let's do all this. Right. All right. So. Our first question comes from Jimmy, and it is the most popular question, Scott. With clone recipes being different in general to match the commercial beer, is celebration even harder to match with the fresh hops compared to what either craft or home brewers were able to get? Hmm. Okay, bear with me, everybody. I'm figuring out how to display the question here. Oh my gosh, let's see here. Well, I would say that's um, there, there's probably a lot to that. Um, I can't uh, really um, say um, on average how long it might take for uh, homebrew suppliers to receive the current year's uh, fresh harvest. Um, uh, I'm not really able to speak to that too much, but, uh, I would imagine it's, it's going to be some months after the harvest actually occurs. Um, so, uh, there's that, I guess. Um, but, um, but still it should be possible, I would say. Um, if the hops are, you know, sealed and, and kept cold, uh, they should remain, um, uh, keep their integrity pretty well, I would say for a couple of months until you can get them. But what I would say uh, is maybe ask uh, at your homebrew supply shop, um, get an idea of, of uh, when they might be able to expect uh, the current crop year uh, shipments and plan around that. 
Yeah, I think I saw some BSG folks in the audience, so maybe they can put an answer there in the uh, chat. Great question, Jimmy. Let's go to Craig's got the next most popular question. How does Scott think homebrewers can get the same effect as a, a torpedo? Ooh, that might be, that would take some uh, creative effort, I would say. Um, the torpedo is uh, not unlike um, something that came out um, later, I think. Uh, I, may, I may be wrong in that. Um, affectionately referred to as the Randall. Yeah. Uh, the Randall is something that is usually used um, at the uh, bar for uh, kind of enhancing finished beer with fruit or more hops or, you know, what have you. Uh, but I would say that uh, um, something torpedo-like could be achieved with a Randall-type setup. Uh, but the main thing is, and as I hinted at earlier, um, really a very, very critical control uh, point uh, for us on all things dry hopping, Celebration Ale or any other beer, is oxygen control. You do not want to oxidize your beer. Uh, except for when you're aerating your wort. <laughs> Every other moment in time past that, you have to do everything possible to keep oxygen far, far away uh, with uh, uh, zero exposure if you can manage it. Of course, that's probably not possible, but, but do the best you can to keep oxygen out of the equation uh, when you're dry hopping or using a Randall uh, because the uh, impact can be very detrimental. And I see Ashton Lewis there in the uh, comments. Mr. Wizard, hello, Ashton. Good to see you. Uh, he says uh, most new crop pellets, cro crop, well, the new crop of hot pellets in the market come into quarter one of the following year from the harvest. So I guess that makes them five months old, sounds like something like that. Yeah, that's um, uh, that's a good point, Ashton. Hi, haven't seen you in a long time. Um, hope you're doing well. Um, I hope that um, that uh, I, th I think that refers to um, pellet. Uh, the pellet process um, is done, of course, at mills um, uh, by suppliers um, a little bit after harvest. Really, I think they started as soon as the, as possible. Uh, but from a, from a brewer point of view, we can um, receive process tops um, several months after the harvest actually occurs generally, unless uh, there's some cer special circumstances involved. From a homebrew point of view, uh, I really don't think there should be uh, too much difference or, or additional time added there. But that's just my guess. All right, let's move on to the next one. That was a great question. Gary has the next question. When you talked about the bottle conditioning, is there some biotransformation that helps bind some of the floral hop character? Yeah, that's a really good one. That is a great question. That's a very important topic right now. Um, you know, hop research is a very big, very much ongoing topic of research. Um, happening in the industry. Um, biotransformation, to my understanding, refers generally to um, um, the yeast interacting with um, specific hop compounds during active uh, metabolic phase of fermentation, uh, creating, uh, you know, new typically fruity tropical um, characters um, from that interaction. Um, bottle conditioning is um, a little different, I would say. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, I'm certainly learning too. I have to say, uh, uh, you know, we learn a lot about hops and, and everything brewing every year. Uh, there's, there's no end to what you can learn. But um, the bottle conditioning environment is really different. Uh, there's a very low uh, cell count. Uh, there's not much yeast in there. Um, and, uh, you know, that yeast has gone directly into a very strictly anaerobic environment. And so there's, there's not a lot of action. Uh, you know, the amount of priming sugar glucose that we put in there is so small, yet it takes two weeks to consume. 
because it's a pretty hostile environment to put fresh yeast into. Um, so biotransformation, there must be some n uh, nuance going on in there. Um, I, I just have to believe that there, there's certainly some, some things going on in there from a um, hop compound developmental point of view with the yeast uh, that we don't know. Um, frankly, I don't think we've ever even looked at it. <laughs> uh, in fact, I know we've never looked at it. <laughs> but uh, uh, biotransformation is, is generally referred to uh, when you are uh, heavily dry hopping the fermenter during active primary fermentation. Gary, I think you stumped him. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, I, I, I'll say it again. That's not something we've really looked at. Um, yeah, but but Great it's interesting. Scary. Yeah, very interesting. All right, James has got one. Let's see what yeast strain do you use? Yeah, uh, well, it's the our standard house ale strain. Um, it is called uh, California Ale uh, uh, by certain suppliers. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you, you nailed it, uh, there with the comment. Um, I think Jeremy, it is, uh, really, uh, our standard strain, uh, which is now available by, uh, most every purveyor that's out there. All right. Ashton has got our next question. Does, Ch does the Chico ale strain promote biotransformation of hop compounds? If so, is the timing of dry hop additions an important control point with respect to the aroma profile of Sierra's dry hopped beers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it really does. Um, we found some really interesting things. Uh, not to get off on too much of a tangent here, um, but we found that there are certain hop varieties that lend um, uh, better into that process than others. Uh, but the yeast certainly uh, is very active in that regard. Um, let me read through here, Ashton. Um, timing of dry hop additions. Yes, it, it is. Uh, I wouldn't say that um, that um, plays a real huge role in celebration, but it certainly does play a huge role in uh, a lot of our other beers. And, and usually I think those are English yeasts, aren't they? Oh the, gosh! To get if the I, bio transformation. Um. Well, uh, maybe or, oh, we open it up a can of worms. <laughs> well, we we may we may be we we may be uh, you know uh, ironically uh, or maybe interestingly I should say the uh, original origin of our house ale yeast. Uh, it's it's generally attributed to Sierra Nevada, uh, but I think. Uh, uh, maybe Ken can um, speak a lot more completely on the topic than I can for sure. But um, uh, my understanding is that it came from uh, the old Ballantine uh, brewery from way, way long ago. Um, and we've uh, been using it since 1980. Well, Ashton's question is, is one I would like to jump off on just a little bit because I just finished a live stream with some very experienced hazy brewers. And we actually did a tasting of hazy little thing. And so speaking of biotransformation, why, what, what keeps celebration clear? I mean, why does it not end up being a hazy IPA with all these hops crammed into it? What, what cha what's different? Well, um, that's a really, really interesting topic. Um, and, you know, first and foremost, it isn't perfectly clear. Um, um, sometimes you'll, you'll find um, a little bit of haze in celebration. Uh, more, than, uh, more often than not, it, it is generally a little bit of a chill haze. But um, the, the haze uh, in hazy New England style, you know, quote unquote, beers are um, much more complicated than that. Um, you have in celebration um, uh, just barley malt for one thing. Uh, and uh, with the whole cone hops, um, the amount of, um, you know, um, 
say, uh, solubility of polyphenols from the hops is, is lower than if you're using pelletized hops or, or processed hops just because of surface area. Um, so, you know, the major components of haze are probably proteins and polyphenols. Um, and without using wheats or oats or a lot of things that we would use in a New England style beer, um, you're, you're helping to eliminate some of that. Torpedo is a great example of a beer that we do not filter. Uh, and it is really pretty brilliant. Um, and um, it's just a question of controlling those levels of proteins to polyphenols ultimately. Okay. That leads me to another question, but <laughs> we, we will move, we'll continue to move forward. Um, now, Jeff asks, uh, do you repitch from the yeast accumulated in the collection vessel? Hmm. So um, I'm thinking that's uh, talking about from the open fermenter where so. we're skimming off. Yeah, we have, uh, but as a, a general process, we don't. Um, the uh, but it is certainly possible. And if I think back, when we have harvested and collected yeast from the um, the Croizen, or um, sometimes it's referred to as the Brandhefe, um, and that's what they call say, it. Say uh, that again. Brandhefe. Brand uh, I think it means brown yeast. Uh, okay. That's a German expression. Uh, that's uh, you, in wheat beers when they do cop, uh, top cropping. Yeah. Um, a lot of times we we found this is going way back, Doug. Um, we haven't really done that in a long time, but okay. um, the. Uh, the the quality of that yeast the the vitality of that yeast is is better than yeast that you get from cone harvesting um, but um, you know in our uh, turn it and burn it kind of you know celebration um, pace when it comes through the brewery every year it's it's really kind of difficult to make that happen so generally uh, we don't but absolutely you can, and when you would, you would find that the quality of that yeast is really uh, um, superior uh, if you can keep uh, keep it microbiologically stable. Yeah, in my visits to come up there and film this, I heard more than once that uh, this your beer is not going to wait on anybody. So <laughs> if I no. if I'm late, I'm going to miss it. <laughs> That's absolutely right. We will not press pause during this process at all, Doug. <laughs> All right. Sandy has the next most popular question. Is there a difference between wet hop and fresh hopped? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Sandy. Yeah. Um, and I, I think we're, we're maybe dissecting um, semantics a little bit at this point, but we call celebration fresh hopped because the hops are, um, you know, immediately delivered to the brewery. Uh, at the earliest possible opportunity uh, after the sort of normal harvest protocol. And that means get the hops off the field, get them um, kilned or dried, and get them baled and get them in a truck and get it on the road. The difference between that and a wet hop beer is that uh, – a wet hop beer skips all the last steps. Uh, so they come right off the field from the picker where you remove the cones from the, the bind. Uh, and then uh, you do not dry them in the kiln. And you, you take them um, into the brewery like that. So these are wet, undried. So think about it a little bit like this. Um, uh fresh basil from the garden that you just go out there and pick and bring it in or uh, basil that you have uh, dried and preserved. Um, and the reason why, and we do both types of beers, by the way. Um, but uh, it, the, the thing is, if you don't dry the hops, you have to use them really immediately or, you know, what happens? You get compost. Uh, they start to they start to go south real quick. Let's just say like that. Um, so we have to dry them uh, in order to to keep them. And, and so that's bring, only done at Chico for that reason, right? 
The wet hop beer. Uh, well, yeah. we do one here in Mills River too. Um, this oh. is, you know, maybe a, a, a tangent that I'll try to um, keep short, but um, right across the river from where we're located is uh, NC State uh, Agricultural Research Center and they grow hops there. So we'll get hops uh, from, oh, I don't know, um, a quarter mile away from the brewery and we'll bring those in and do small batches with that. But uh, that's the problem with wet hops is they do not keep and you have to use them immediately. Um, the or the they, harvest ale is the one that uh, is the fresh, uh, is the wet hopped one. That's from right. Sierra. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And you can find that uh, uh, in, um, let's say, um, mid September each year. I missed it this year, but I'm going to look for it next year. There's always next year, Doug. <laughs> uh, Paul asked the question, which Yakima hop farm do you source from? Oh, there's a bunch. Um, there's a whole bunch, uh, um, too many to name, really. Um, we've got some really good relationships with uh, hop farms um, for years and years and years. Uh, we, we don't do a lot of uh, direct uh, farm purchasing, but we'll go through hop um, suppliers. Um, and there are numerous farmers uh, within uh, the family of, of the various suppliers. So um, just think uh, uh, generally that um, they we're talking about the Pacific Northwest. So Washington, uh, Oregon, and Idaho is where all these hops are coming from. Let's see. Oh, I don't have a name on this next question, but it's very popular. So the unnamed person uh, if I recall back in the day, Sierra Nevada prevented sale to the public prior to Thanksgiving. I have fond memories of a single bar in a small college town I lived in opening Thanksgiving evening so they could be the first ones in town to serve the beer on tap. When did this policy change and why? Oh my gosh. That's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, I don't think I have any information on that at all. Um, I'm um, um, nearly 20 years at the brewery, and I've heard a lot of stories. We uh, uh, try to be uh, at our own brewery, uh, the first place to sell um, Celebration Ale. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, we, we've got uh, a distribution um, system to try and get it everywhere really as soon as we possibly can um yeah that that's uh, that sounds like there's there's a really great story in there somewhere that i don't know about that i need to find out about so sorry i, I can't really uh comment on that one okay I, I don't have any contact information there if if you will maybe put your name in the chat or or if, if you got this event if you reply to it i will try and get an answer to that all right, Jimmy has the next question. Do you think the more classic hops, such as classic sea hops, for example, can provide a longer lasting flavor slash aroma or even a longer shelf life than the newer strains of hops? Mm, now that is an interesting question. Um, really interesting. Uh, you know, um, it, it, it's certainly possible. Um, in my experience, we we use um, a lot of new varieties, uh, experimental varieties, before they become public, if they ever do become public. Um, you know uh, that um, uh, you know we we are unfamiliar with, and we'll we'll brew with those. We'll dry hop with them. And then as the beer matures, sometimes there are some really dramatic changes to the character. Uh, it can go in any number of directions. Uh, the general pattern is that the, um, you know, uh, first the esters start to dissipate and then uh, provided, of course, I have to say, uh, you know, a little disclaimer that, um, you know, any type of um, oxidation that occurs or, um, you know, uh, mistreatment of beer in any of the, the various ways um, uh, 
can can really change that equation dramatically. So so you may not notice the nuances of what the hops are doing underneath uh, a lot of other things that are happening. But um, sometimes uh, we do see, um, you know, certain beers, you know, even um, say single hop beers change um, on a uh, on a week to week basis. But the general pattern is that the esters uh, will dissipate and then uh, very slowly the intensity of the um, uh, hop um, aroma will dissipate. Um, the flavor will maintain, uh, but the aroma will dissipate. Uh, and then finally the flavor starts to change um, after all that. So um, uh, I, I, think, I think I would say it depends. Um, we found that that some hops uh, uh, really seem to be, you know, will hang tough over time, you know, um, and and others will 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 change a little bit, but it might not be for the worse. It might be for the better, um, or it might just be for the different. But the overall uh, factor, I think that that is the most important in the way flavor and aroma changes over time as beer ages is. Um, you know, how much oxygen or light or heat uh, is uh, being added to the equation. Scott, keep talking. I'm going to rinse my glass because I'm going I'm to give a pour another try. Well, okay. That sounds all right. Uh, let me see here um, if I can figure out how to work it. I'm just going to go to the top of the list here, Doug. Uh, what temperature do we use for the hot bag fresh hopping? Uh, well, we... we um, do a fermentation, um, pretty standard stuff, um, uh, for most of our, our ales, um, 68 degrees Fahrenheit, primary fermentation, and we will move the beer onto dry hops, um, at the same temperature. Um, as I mentioned, uh, earlier, uh, that's for oxygen scavenging and, and protection against, um, beer oxidation. So, um, uh, then, of course, um, and the same thing with torpedo, the, the, the vessel torpedo process, um, the, the Randall, if you will. Um, we, we always start out warm uh, where uh, the yeast can um, scavenge and um, 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 negate the damaging oxygen content that might be present in the hops. And then we chill the beer down from there. So, um, as I mentioned on celebration with the dry hop bags, we go in at standard fermentation temperature and then it cools down in the tank and it, and it stands on the hops cold for a while as well. Um, bottle condition, uh, bottles. What about kegs? Yeah. Oh, there's, there's a whole lot of story in there on that one, uh, from, um, Edward. Good question. We have, um, Going back and forth on that one a little bit, um, uh, for some years now, for quite a number of years now, we don't keg condition the kegs uh, because, um, and it's just a, you know, volume to surface area um, function, the conditioning process in keg takes, oh, around about 30 days. It takes a month for the beer to condition in a keg, whereas... Um, in bottles, it takes uh, about two weeks. So it's uh, possible for sure, um, but fairly prohibitive from a logistical point of view. So so we don't do that. Uh, you for got me beat on the head, poor. Well, let's I see it, Doug. Oh, it I've looks got beautiful. The, uh, Look maybe three fingers. Oh, it's gorgeous. That, that's a good pour right there. Yeah, it's delicious beer. See if I can get a little more out of it, but I think it was starting to come down the side a little bit. Oh, there you go. Look at that. Oh, Ooh, is it going to collapse on me? Nah. <laughs> um, let's see here. Uh, next question. Um, do you send the spent hops to the local farms as animal feed? Looks like a lot of spent hops uh, tonnage, uh, from Tom. Yeah. Um, we, we compost them. Um, it turns out, um, uh, I think we've tried this. Um, cattle don't like to eat spent hops. They like, uh, yeast. 
they like beer, they like spent grain, uh, but they don't like spent ops. So, um, you know, uh, I don't know a heck of a lot about cattle, but I guess they, they don't like the, the, the bitterness, um, very much. So, so they won't eat it, but, uh, it does compost very well. And we, uh, can get that into, um, various, uh, facilities who specialize in that. In Chico, we do that ourselves. Um, and in Mills River, uh, we use a local, uh, composter as where that all goes. That's almost brilliant. Little yeah. haze. Yeah. Like I said, we don't filter it. Uh, you know, we use a, um, centrifuge to remove the yeast. Um, and, and that's it. We want to ultimately on the beer, we want to, uh, do as, as little handling as we can. Uh, we want to have the most traditional approach, the most natural, uh, beer possible. So, um, on celebration, we, we don't filter it at all. We don't add anything to it except the water and the, the yeast and the malt and the hops. And we put some calcium salt in there and, uh, and that's it. Uh, nothing else goes in. And, um, you know, um, there's, it's a little different every year, which I think is kind of special too. So I see that, uh, Michael figured out how I got that, uh, 2020 on the, uh, on my glassware. <laughs> you might not have noticed that Scott, cause I just felt like it was terrible not to have something on there. So it oh, is the label off of the bottle that I uh, that. Yeah, stuck yeah. on there. <laughs> Good one, Doug. Well, I just I think it's important. They'd be marked yeah. well and, and, and this this is a, a glass, it is a Sierra Nevada glass. Um, but I just didn't think that did it justice. I like this better. Yeah, so. looks looks good. Looks good. <laughs> uh good good eye, Michael. Uh, so Georgia has our next question. After collecting the krausen that flows into the hatch, you mentioned what's the process for Sierra Nevada to reuse the yeast? Um, yeah. So would we do that? Um, that uh, there's there's a little small tank in the floor. Maybe some of you out there have visited the brewery, um, and uh, maybe you have seen those tanks. They're right behind a glass wall. Um, uh, at what we call the grand tasting room. So that's, uh, at the end of a guided tour where, uh, folks gather to, to try, uh, various things that we have on tap and, uh, the open fermenters are directly behind there. So, um, there's a chute, a uh, little, um, you know, chute that comes off the tank and goes directly into a very small tank, which is, um, um, embedded in the floor there. So that tank is tied to our yeast handling system. So we can pump that out and back into the yeast room for reuse. That's a good question. Yeah, I had to step over that quite a lot to uh, <laughs> to get my camera set up and retrieved and, and all that. That's right. You got to watch your step in there. Yeah. Uh, Jason, there's our next question. Are hot pellets used in any Sierra Nevada beers for dry hopping? And if so... How do you dry hop with pellets for those beers? Oh, man. Um, yeah, once in a blue moon, we're using pellets. Um, f for the most part, not. Um, uh, we've kind of gone down the road uh, in um, more uh, some more of our recent offerings, like Hazy Little Thing, for example, where we're using um, what would be what would be, be maybe called more a, a hop powder. So, um, in terms of pellets, normally there's a type 90 and a type 45. And that means, uh, at the mill, the whole cone hops are, uh, milled into a fine powder with a hammer mill under cold conditions, even cryogenic conditions. And then, um, um, run through a series of sieves. And the sieves are there to remove, um, ideally, um, some of the green matter from the hop cone, but preserve uh, or, or maybe concentrate, let's say, by removing green stuff, you can concentrate the lupulin glands, uh, which are where 
uh, most of the um, uh, aromatic oils are located. And so a T90 means, uh, you know, 90% of the original weight of cone hop that went in comes out again and a little bit of the bract material or the, uh, the green matter of the hop cone is removed. Um, and then the hops are pelletized after that. And that means they're run through a, a pellet dye, uh, which is, um, oh gosh, uh, like a like a, a steel dye with the small holes in it and, and the uh, resulting milled materials pressed through there to produce those pellets. Um, and that's done nowadays um, as cold as possible and even in a nitrogen purge environment to try and uh, preserve the hops as most as you can. Um, uh, the type 45 is, um, you know, 45% of the original cone weight is preserved and the rest of is sieved out, which is green matter. So you have an even further concentration of lupulin material, uh, which is again where the um, active aromatics are located. So then uh, T45, we, we use a little bit of that. We call it lupulin powder. Um, this is, um, you know, uh, pretty new uh, when, when we started using it. It's, it's fairly widely available now. Um, but it, it's, it's the very same material, but not pelletized. So the last step where you push it through the dye is, is eliminated because that step, um, just by, you know, physical handling will um, damage some of the lupulin glands. So you lose a little bit of aroma there. So we're using uh, powder, T45 powder, um, in a couple of brands that we do, um, which is a little different than pellet hopping. So um, it's a whole different topic. Maybe we can talk at that, talk on that uh, at another time. Right. In this part of the program, Scott, we're pretty well at lightning round. We, we have oh, uh, slightly more than 20 minutes, and we have 17 questions. Okay. So we're going to have to knock them out about one minute a piece. Oh, is there a uh, buzzer? It, <laughs> I ought to have one. <laughs> uh, but again, for those uh, that are there, vote up the questions and I will try. We'll, we'll try and make sure those get answered in case we don't get them all answered. So, okay. Can I just round, uh, interject uh, real quick here, Doug? Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not real good at looking at the, the chat here, uh, but uh, I just wanted to say to everybody who's out there, uh, thanks so much for being here. Um, it, it's uh, quite a story to tell uh, the way we make celebration. Um, it's, it's, a, it's something we're, we're super proud of. We'll hang our hats on that any day of the week. So um, uh, thanks for being there and let me uh, tell you about it. And, and it, we appreciate hearing it because it gives us a whole new appreciation for what's so passionate to uh, the brewers there at Sierra Nevada. And I think you can see there in the chat there, Scott, we've got several thank yous from uh, a, a new dip, uh, Jeremy and Sandy and Edwards. So we're oh, going to run through these. Thank so you, Edwards people. got our next thank question. You. Okay. Uh, Bottle Lightning conditioned. Round. Bottle conditioned bottles. What about keg? Oh, we did that one. Sorry. Yeah, we did that one. Um, the celebration ale get affected by hop creep. And this comes from Jeremy. Oh man, um, yeah, that's a great topic, a very hot topic. And um, in the case of celebration, not so much. We find that uh, whole cone dry hopping is impacted by that a heck of a lot less than pellet or powder dry hopping. So uh, I would say. I would say on that one, I would say a no on that one. Great question. That's another webinar, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Uh, thoughts on cans versus bottles. Oh, man. We, uh, we've done celebration in the can, I think, once. Uh, and it was can conditioned, of course, uh, like we do with the pale ale when we put it in cans. Um, the... Um, uh, that, that was, a, a, a different story, but, uh, my own personal opinion, um, cans are, um, certainly selling a whole lot, uh, you know, uh, more readily in the market nowadays, um, for a whole lot of reasons, uh, bottles, uh, are, are declining, um, somewhat, 
Um, cans have a better seal integrity. So when you seam the top of the can on to the body, uh, that's an oxygen barrier, 100% oxygen barrier. You cannot oxidize the beer any more than you've already done upstream of that. Uh, with bottles, um, you will have a, even with our, you know, very special, uh, you know, a somewhat proprietary liner in there, you will have a very slow, very slow, uh, um, but you will have oxygen ingress. So uh, when you have bottles, drink them right away. Absolutely. Um, but uh, you know what? There's there's some there's a certain amount of you know tradition and class in a bottle, which I think will always be there uh, that you just can't have in a can. So I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of different facets to that. Yeah. But uh, that's, that's a, almost a religious discussion, isn't it? <laughs> maybe so. Maybe so. <laughs> oh, good good question. Uh, we'll move on to the next one. Fred asked, "Is Centennial?" dominant in the flavor or the aroma hops and i assume that applies to to celebration um yeah maybe uh, of the aroma hops um centennial yeah i would say so um, um it's really kind of the hallmark of the the beer um you'll get uh, a certain floral character there a little rose perhaps um but the Cascade is, is really delivering that pine. So yeah, it's really a symbiotic uh, uh, result of the two hops being used together. Next question comes from James. Do you play with the water, maybe adjusting pH? Oh, uh, you know, not, not, uh, not so much. Uh, uh, well, uh, yes and no. Yes and no. Uh, uh, we, we do do uh, different things at each brewery with the water on Celebration and uh, other beers too because the source water, uh, our brewing liquor, uh, as we, we call that, what water goes directly into the beer process, uh, the quality of that water is very different between Mills River and, and Chico. So we do have to do different things uh, to come up with the same result in the end. Um, but ultimately, um, I would say in a nutshell, um, um, uh, alkalinity, uh, total alkalinity is, is super important um, and in terms of pH, the resulting pH, uh, particularly towards the end of loudering. Uh, and then uh, calcium content um, is, is of critical importance. So we have specifications for all of those. So uh, we play with it a little bit, but we don't, you know, um, RO the water or anything like that. We're doing some uh, very basic adjustments, uh, mostly with um, um, adding salts, uh, calcium salts in Mills River, and then trying to reduce the al alkalinity of the water in Chico. Um, again, because the, the waters are quite different in each lo location. Robert says, thank you so much for this amazing broadcast. Oh, thanks, Robert. Uh, that is awesome. Um, and everybody really, again, you know, um, nothing makes me happier than, than telling everybody about our beer and, and enjoying beer together. So um, particularly this year when it's a virtual world, uh, <laughs> it's really great to be able to sit here and, and uh, sip a celebration and, and talk about it. So. Real beer in a virtual world. <laughs> oy, 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 oy. Yeah, that's right. So um, anyway, I'm honored to be here. So thanks uh, to all of you. Well, I, I know I speak for everyone. We're thrilled that you're here. So Jimmy asked the next question, and looks like we have 15 minutes and 12 questions. Does the final gravity of celebration or the malt used in general, if it's more than just flavorful, help with the balance where the bitterness doesn't seem as high as it is listed? Hmm. Okay. Let, let me look into this one a little bit. I know you're going to ring the buzzer on me on this one. I'm pretty <laughs> sure, Doug. Uh, the uh, final gravity on celebration is, uh, oh, and I'm just going off a of memory um, and it's not I, I can look it clad, up. I'll tell you, but I want to say it's probably around um, 3.8 to 4 Play-Doh, somewhere in there. Um, and uh, so uh, traditionally, 
um, you know, higher uh, bitterness needs a little more body to create balance. Um, and with celebration being really a very traditional beer, perhaps even if I can just go on a tangent, don't ring the buzzer, Doug. Um, it might be one of the um, earliest, um, you know, uh, modern IPAs in America. Um, it is a, a very unique beer. In 1981, you know, tell me a brewery who is making IPAs, uh, right? So this is, a, you know, a, a, a aggressively bitter, dry hopped to, to all, um, um, you know, levels, uh, and it needed some body to back it up. Um, it's... Uh, uh, kind of unique that way. Now, nowadays you find a lot more um, beers that uh, keep the bitterness in IPAs, IPA speak, um, low, quite low. Um, even 30 uh, for an IPA is very low um, uh, BUs. Uh, and in, in terms of balance, you can dry them out a little bit more and still have really, really good drinkability. So, um, the final gravity, uh, the malt used in general, it has a very high amount of crystal malt, uh, which will um, increase uh, what the final gravity will land at. And the balance um, is really kind of in there at the right around, uh, let's say, four Play-Doh, let's say, and um, 68 to 70 BUs, somewhere in there. Um, that was a super question there, Jimmy. Uh, Scott, we're like 13 minutes and 11 questions. Yep. Are I'll you wet best. hopping with such a short window? Uh, no, it's really hard to do that. So uh, the harvest deal is uh, the wet hops are used um, uh, all in the brew house. We have played with that and it is possible to do it, but um, it's really a chore. So you, you can, uh, but um, um, typically not. And, and that's coming from somebody that doesn't mind doing celebration and you're uh, calling wet hopping a chore. <laughs> <laughs> that's another uh, podcast, Doug, because <laughs> wet hopping, you have to use, you know, nine or 10 times the weight of hops per barrel because oh, wow. uh, you have to factor in the water weight in there. So it is really, I mean, hops coming out your ears and, and everywhere else uh, to do <laughs> wet hop uh, beers. So okay. that's, it's a little different thing. but uh, The video on that will be great. <laughs> oy, oy, oy. That's Good. quite a thing. <laughs> oh, I lost your audio, Doug. Um, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Um, I'm missing your audio. Sorry, Doug. Um, but I'll just go through here. Um, how is this year's recipe different than last? Well, it's not, other than the, the hop varieties are... Um, the, the, the hop varieties are the same, but the crop year is different. So the, uh, uh, you know, a, as an agricultural product, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you know, it's farming. The hops are going to be a little different every year, no matter what. So um, the variations in um, uh, the character of the beer uh, are entirely due uh, just to the crop year. Uh, because we don't change anything uh, in the rest beer in the brew house. Um, I hope this is going okay. Uh, I see Doug said he needs some. He needs a minute. Um, somebody, let me know if you can hear me. Um, what is the IBU for this year version? It's always the same. Uh, again, and and uh, and I'm sorry if uh, 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 I can't recall the exact specs. Um, but I want to say it's around 68, and we always shoot for the same. Um, hasn't someone been making those bags? Oh, yeah. You know, you're right. Uh, question from Edward. Yeah. Um, 
That's a great question. So these hot bags, um, and, and thanks for confirming you guys can hear me. I appreciate that. These hot bags uh, are made right in uh, in Chico um, uh, by uh, by Jackie, who uh, worked in our Chico tap room uh, for oh gosh, I don't know, probably thirty years, uh, and she was making those uh, by hand. And and um, uh, I don't know if she'll keep making them for next year or not, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so that's a in-house project. It's pretty great. Are you back, Doug? I hope. Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Great. <laughs> uh, you know, next. It, it never fails. There's a technical problem, but thank you for keeping things flowing. Oh, I'm doing my best, but uh, we're running out of time. As you say, I'm going to uh, cruise along here. What's the flame out hop charge pounds per barrel contact time in the kettle for pale ale? Oh my gosh, for pale ale. I'm on celebration time here today, uh, Thomas. Uh, flame out hops. Uh, uh, and I guess what you mean by that, what we would call that is um, hop back hops. So um, hops that we add directly to the hop back and not to the kettle. Um, and that's probably on uh, in the range of uh, 65% of everything that's added in the brew house. Uh, and that's probably pretty consistent with pail to celebration and torpedo for that matter. It goes right in the hot back and not in the kettle. And the contact time is probably 15 minutes to empty the kettle through that hot bed in the hot back. Uh, moving on, what pitch rate, oxygen? Oh, uh, pitch rate is a function of original gravity. Uh, for ales, we do... Um, a half a million cells per mil times degrees original gravity Plato um, is our standard pitch rate. Oxygen concentration. We use air. We don't use bottled oxygen, just standard air. And, and you can, um, you, you'd be calling it a good day if you can get up to maybe 8 ppm or something like that. Uh, temperature is uh, 68. Uh, for a lot of what we do, um, what's the biggest disappointment, even if minute with celebration? Oh, man, disappointment. Um, well, uh, gosh, that's a great question. I don't know how I'm going to answer that one. Um, we already talked about how it does change a little bit every year, and sometimes the hops are a little here and a little there, and um, a lot of times our memories of the best celebration we ever had was more situational uh, than liquid related. Uh, we can all think of, um, you know, um, Thanksgivings uh, involving celebration ale, for example. Um, and over the years, you'll have a lot of memories associated with those if you're anything like me. Um, the... Uh, other thing I would say is, uh, you know, celebration is sort of a flash in the pan. You know, we, we brew it, um, you know, we brew it like hell, uh, from the moment we can get the hops into the brewery, uh, and then, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, six weeks later or so we're done. So, uh, it, it waits for no one. <laughs> it waits for no one. Even so. the camera guy. <laughs> yeah. So sometimes I think, you know, I'd love to have some celebration more than just in the autumn of the year. But perhaps if that were the case, uh, it wouldn't be quite as special for us. All right. Five minutes and looks like two more questions. So Thomas asks, I've heard you open ferment Narwhal Imperial style. What is the reason behind doing that for a beer? And maybe you could tell me a little bit more about Narwhal and it's regarding its fermentation, temperature, length of fermentation before before cold crashing, maturation Oy. time, or anything else interesting about the process or ingredients. Yeah, that's that's a good one, Thomas. Um that that's a that's a lot of info. Um we we will on occasion I think open ferment that, uh but uh um, I can't really speak too much about it. Um, I've been out here in Mills River for, um, oh, I don't know, over seven years now. Um, and that's made in Chico. 
So um, I would say that there's a little bit of uh, open firm. Um, I could tell you that a little fun fact without really diving too deep. The um, the uh, inspiration for Narwhal was um, uh, maybe some of you will remember for our um, 30th anniversary, we had Fritz and Ken's Stout um, as a, one of the anniversary uh, four-pack beers. And that was the um, inspiration for the Narwhal. Um, so there's, there's a lot of history behind that. Somebody said, uh, we should talk more about Narwhal at another time. I couldn't agree more. There's a lot to dig into on that one. So I uh, apologize, Thomas, but we got to move along. Yeah. And it's interesting. Narwhal, a barrel aged Mark Narwhal is what Ken was drinking when, uh, when he was answering my questions on bottle condition, bottle conditioning and everything on celebration. Yeah. Yeah. Jeremy asks, what is the IBUs this year's for celebration? It seems a little more bitter than previous yeah. years. Yeah, we got that one already, uh, Doug, and it's the same specs as every year. Um, okay. and analytically, they measure uh, uh, the same every year. Uh, All right, and I then Ryan say, has our last question. Yeah. What kind of recycling do you do at the brewery? Oh, I oh, know that's a, that's a big one. <laughs> that is a big one. And, and holy smokes, you name it. Um, we have so much going on there. We're really proud to say that we're, uh, you know, always, always, always working to be a zero waste facility. Um, and we are, um, you know, uh, so successful um, in that endeavor. We have uh uh, very little, very, very little that actually does go to a landfill. Uh, we recycle everything from spent grains and spent hops um, and, you know, um, um, damaged packaging material, for example, cardboard and glass and crowns and, and so on. And um, all the way up to um, even uh, uh, at the brewery, we have employee recycling drop off. Uh, because uh, we can be sure that um, uh, the recycling uh, goes to the appropriate facility uh, that may or may not, uh, may not exist in in locations where where everybody lives. Uh, so we do. We a, also have a, a world class lot. water treatment facility, as I recall. Well, we do. We do. We have a wastewater treatment plant uh, where uh, the effluent from the brewery that's essentially anything that goes down the drains within the walls of the brewery goes to our own treatment facility where we um, clean it up before we give it to the MSD, um, which is the municipal uh, sewage district, I think. Uh, uh, it, it's pre-treated. They, they really don't have to do much with it. And uh, one of the benefits of that is the byproduct of that is uh, uh, methane, which we bring back to the brewery and use in our boilers as opposed to releasing it to the atmosphere. Scott, we um, got wait. about 90 seconds. Wait, 90 <clears throat> seconds. Okay. 90 seconds. <laughs> but you also uh, have your own CO2, right? You don't have to buy CO2. That's correct. Yeah, the CO2 that we need for the entire brewery's needs, um, we produce it ourselves from our own um, collection system. Uh, so we collect uh, CO2 from fermentation and clean it, compress it, uh, into liquid and then we use that around the brewery as we need to all right we are almost done here about 45 seconds uh thank you everybody that joined us tonight we had a huge crowd scott 267 people so far uh that's that's a record as of late so that was a huge crowd thank you for everybody uh, scott thank Shoot. you for taking so much time <laughs> and because a lot of the efforts, not only the two hours tonight, but the hours you put into uh, helping me do the filming. So cheers to you, my friend. Cheers, Doug, and, and cheers to everyone. Really, I, I can't thank you all uh, enough for being here and, and letting me uh, tell you a little bit about us and, and what we do. Um, 